Hello, I'm Professor Simon Kirby, and this is my Garden Talk. How many languages do you speak? It seems like a, an easy question, right? Well, it's one that I get asked a lot as a linguist. And if I'm going to be completely honest with you, it's a question I'm always dreading and feel a bit uncomfortable about because I have to rather sheepishly say I actually only speak one language and that's English. But what if I were to tell you that one of the most famous linguists alive, and certainly the most influential, Noam Chomsky, has actually argued that there is only one human language. Or rather, he's suggested that all human languages are at some fundamental level all the same. Now what we're going to do in this garden talk is I'm going to take you on a journey to understand why Noam Chomsky has made that argument. And along the way, we're going to look at some very, very recent results from my lab, so recent actually that they haven't even been published yet. And where we're going to end up is to one of the most contentious ideas in modern cognitive science. This idea takes us way beyond language and gets at, gets at some really fundamental questions about the nature of the human mind. One of the most difficult things about studying humans is that because we're humans ourselves, we're awfully close to the subject matter. In some ways, it's very difficult to, to study ourselves because we're just too close. We can't see the wood for the trees, if you like. So this has led um, some linguists to suggest that we need ways of getting some distance from the subject matter. Because if you think about it, language is our species defining characteristic. And we all use language to communicate. Um, we even communicate about language using language. That's what I'm doing right now. Some researchers even think that the stuff of thought is language. So what's going on inside our skulls right now is fundamentally linguistic in nature. So if we're that close to language, how can we hope to study it objectively? So one of the things that Noam Chomsky has done is he suggested a thought experiment to try and get some distance, some perspective on the question of language. And he asks the following question. What would happen if a Martian linguist was to come to Earth and study the languages of the world? What would they conclude? What Chomsky suggests is that the Martian linguist may well conclude that there's actually only one human language. We all speak the same language. Obviously, there's some variation, but the Martian linguist, according to Chomsky, would think that that variation was relatively minor and not particularly important. That variation kind of happens at the margins of language. But fundamentally, all the things that we see in the world are the same language. So the Martian linguist might say, these earthlings, they're overly impressed by the differences between English, say, and Gallic, and think that these two things are different languages. But actually, they're the same underlyingly. Now, that's a strange idea. And what I want to do in this talk is really try and help you understand why Chomsky might have made this claim, why Chomsky's Martian thinks that there is only one human language, that all human languages are fundamentally the same thing. But before we get to that, I want to point out that not all linguists agree this is actually quite a familiar um, feature of my discipline, that there's a lot of disagreement. Um, but on this issue, there's absolutely massive disagreement. So other very influential linguists argue the exact opposite. So they would say that the Martian linguist would come to Earth and look at all the languages spoken around the planet and then conclude that they are all so different from one another that they needed to each be studied as if 
They were their own unique snowflake. So these languages vary at every level, at all aspects of their structure and how they work, that really there's nothing universal that can be said about all of them. Okay, so we've got this huge disagreement. We have Chomsky's Martian, who says that all languages are essentially the same, and we have other linguists who argue the exact opposite and say, really, there's nothing universal that can be said about all languages. So, how do we resolve this? How do we deal with this kind of massive difference of opinion and get at what's really going on? Well, there's something that I said there that might help us get to the bottom of things. I used the word universal. So I want to spend a little bit of time explaining what I mean by the word universal, or rather what all linguists mean when they talk about universals. So when we talk about a language universal, you might think that we mean that this is something that is true of all the languages of the world. And sometimes we do mean that. But mostly, when linguists talk about language universals, what they're talking about is something that is true of most languages of the world. So there can be exceptions. The idea is if you find some way, or uh, some way that languages work, that crops up again and again and again, and some other equally plausible way that languages could work that we very rarely see, we say that that's a language universal. So language universals are properties of language that crop up much more um, frequently than you'd expect by chance. All right, so um, let me give you an example that might make this a little bit more concrete. So, consider a really simple sentence in English. Um, consider the sentence, uh, the pirate throws the saxophone. Okay, it's a bit of a weird sentence, and you'll see later in this talk why I used that, those, that particular sentence. Okay, so the pirate throws the saxophone. Okay, now there's three parts to that sentence. And a lot of um, um, simple sentences have these three parts in them, okay? So there's the pirate. That's what we call the subject of the sentence. There's throws, which is the verb. And there's the saxophone, which is the object. So subject, verb, object. And we can abbreviate those to S, V, and O, okay? So you're learning some linguistics here. Now, in English, we order them in that order, right? So we have the subject first, then the verb, then the object. So what we say is that English has a basic word order of S, V, O. Now, not all languages do it that way. So a language like Japanese, for example, orders things differently. So in that sentence, they would have something like the pirate the saxophone throws. Okay, so that's subject, object, verb, or S-O-V. So we say the basic word order of English is S-V-O, and the basic word order of Japanese is S-O-V. Fine. Now, if you think about it, there are six different ways you could order those three basic elements, right? S-V-O, S-O-V, O-S-V, O-V-S, and so on six different logically possible orders of those basic elements in a sentence. So what linguists do is they go out into the world and um, catalogue as many different languages as possible and see, for example, what their basic word orders would be. And it turns out that indeed all six different possible orders do show up somewhere in the world, in the world's languages. So you might think, okay, there's nothing universal that can be said about basic word order. Everything that's possible shows up. But actually that's not true. It turns out that the vast majority of all the languages in the world either use SVO, like English, or SOV, like Japanese. In fact, in a sample of 1,400 languages, only four languages have been found that use the order OSV, OVS, sorry. 
So there are all of these logically possible orders, but only some of them show up with any high frequency. So we call that a um, universal. Even though there's exceptions to it, it's universally true that the most likely orders for language are SVO and SOV. So that's an example universal. And we're going to talk about why that might happen in a minute. But I'm just going to give you another more interesting and more subtle example. Um, so if we just zoom in um, for a minute on just part of a sentence, so ignore the subject for the moment and just consider the verb and the object, so throws the saxophone. So there's two ways you could order that, right, in a language. You could put the verb and then the object, like English, or the object and the verb, like Japanese. And about 50% of the world's languages have verb before object, and 50% of them have object before verb, roughly. So the world's languages are kind of split 50-50 between those two possible orders. Now let's think about a different phrase in language. So a phrase something like under the table. This is a different, this is, uh, introduces a new type of word, the word under, and that's called a preposition. And it's a word that um, often is used to indicate spatial relations between things. So in English, we have prepositions where like a word like under that comes before um, the noun, like the table, okay? So in English, we have prepositions under the table. But other languages have things called postpositions. So they would say something like the table under and put it afterwards. And once again, about 50% of the languages of the world have prepositions and about 50% of the languages of the world have postpositions. Again, seems to be a roughly equal split. So you might say, okay, so all of these logically possible ways of organizing your language occur out there in the world, but not so fast. So it turns out that if you have your verb before an object in your language, you're massively more likely to have prepositions than postpositions. And if you have your verb after your object in your language, you're massively more likely to have postpositions than prepositions. So these two bits of language pattern together. Um, and we call this uh, word order harmony. And this is an important kind of uh, language universal. Okay, so that's weird, right? This kind of seems like a spooky coincidence. Why would one part of a language predict some other part of the language? Why do languages pattern in these ways? Um, so, and also, like, more importantly, what's it got to do with the Martian linguist? Well, we need a way of explaining these patterns. Whenever we see a pattern like this, where some things happen and other things don't, um, that's where we need an explanation. So science proceeds by spotting these kind of patterns and saying we need some kind of explanation for them. So one possible explanation for patterns like this is it's to do with history, right? So it turns out that prepositions and postpositions in many languages are actually um, used to, they started their life earlier in the history of the language as verbs. So verbs sometimes change into prepositions or postpositions. If that's the case, then maybe it's not so surprising that if you've got your verbs patterning before your object in a language, then eventually you'll end up with prepositions. And if you have your verbs after your objects, then you'll end up with postpositions. So maybe that's an explanation. And it's a pretty good one. It doesn't seem to work for all of the patterns we see, but it's a plausible way of um, tackling the question of why these patterns exist. So it's a compelling story, but it's not the only one on the table. The reason why Chomsky emphasizes the commonality between languages is that he believes that these universals that we see out there in the languages of the world reflect something much more fundamental about the way the human brain works. What Chomsky is arguing is that these universals reflect what he calls a universal grammar. A universal grammar that underpins um, 
the basic structure of all of the languages in the world. And where does that universal com grammar come from? It comes from inside our heads. So every one of us, according to Chomsky, is born with this template for the way languages should work. And that explains why languages have these patterns, these spooky coincidences out there in the world. So the languages of the world are reflecting something about the way our brains work. So for Chomsky, we are born with this innate knowledge, kind of um, foreknowledge of what language is going to be like. This is quite a startling idea, right? So that children are come into the world already knowing something about language. They already come into the world with this universal grammar in place, and that explains why languages pattern the way they do. So if this is the case, we should be able to detect these universals, these properties of the distribution of languages in the world, in every one of us. So somewhere in your head, there should be some detectable trace of the way all of the languages of the world work. So not just the language you speak, but all of the other ones too. That's quite an exciting idea, right? That somewhere in our brains is this kind of blueprint for all of the languages in the world. So one of the things that we do in, in my lab and many other uh, labs are also investigating this is to try and find this, to try and spot this, um, this blueprint that's in, our, in all of our brains. And the way we do this, there's, there's two approaches that we use in my lab, and I'll go through them in turn. So the first approach is that we try and see what people do when we ask them to spontaneously create a new language. So how on earth do we do that? Well, one of the ways we do it is um, that we get people to try and communicate using only their hands and no speech, right? So we take away their ability to use the language that they learnt and ask them to communicate in an entirely new medium. So one of the people who've done, who's done a lot of work on this in my lab is uh, Marika Schaustra. And what she did is she got people to describe the kind of simple events like the pirate throwing the saxophone using gesture. Tell you what, let's try it now, okay? So we're gonna do an experiment. Right, now I can't see you, so your cameras aren't on, so don't be embarrassed, but I want you to pretend that I can see you, okay? And I'm, I really mean this, this is only going to work if you actually do this at home, okay? So sitting there at your laptops, I'm going to ask you to try and imagine communicating to me, just using gesture, no speech, the event, the pirates throwing the saxophone, okay? So imagine that you've got to convey that to me just using gesture. Go. I'll give you a few seconds. All right, have you had a go? So I'm going to have a go. So this is what I would do. I would do... Okay, so that's a pirate. This is a guy with an eye patch. Uh, that's a sa my attempt at playing a saxophone and that's me throwing it, okay? Now notice what I did there, and I suspect that at least some of you will have done the same thing, maybe with different gestures, but the important thing is the order, right? So I did pirate, saxophone, throw, right? That's not the order of English. It's S-O-V, so it's the order of Japanese and half the other languages of the world. Okay, that's kind of weird, and it turns out that that the vast majority of, well, actually about 75% of people will produce that order when we do this in experimental settings. Okay, cool. But let's try another meaning, okay? So now I'm gonna ask you to gesture the pirate dreams about a saxophone. Okay, have a go. All right, here's my attempt. Okay, so pirate, dreams, saxophone. Notice the order's changed, right? So I've done subject, verb, object, SVO. So that's the English order. 
And again, the majority of participants, when we give them meanings like this, produce SVO. And in fact, across a lot of experiments where this kind of thing is done, we either get one of these two orders, SOV or SVO. So for some reason, and um, I'll get to reasons later, um, when we ask people to gesture, they start producing one of these two word orders that we see in the world's languages, even though they don't have those orders in their, necessarily in their native language. So something about the pattern of word orders in the world's languages is detectable in the gestures people produce in this kind of experiment. Okay, so that's the basic word order question. So what about harmony? Well, another one of my colleagues, Jenny Culbertson, has done a lot of groundbreaking work using a technique which we called artificial language learning. And in an artificial language learning experiment, we make up as experimenters a miniature language that has some feature we're interested in. And we teach it to participants in the lab. So we get participants into the lab, or we get them to go online and try one of our experiments online. We teach them the language and then we test them. And what Jenny has done is she's taken languages that obey these universal patterns, these harmonic patterns, and languages that don't obey these universal patterns, so they're non-harmonic. And what she's found is that participants learn the languages that obey the harmonic universal better than learning the languages that disobey the harmonic universal. And that's despite these languages being equally different from the native language that they speak. So we can construct a language that's not like English, say, but is harmonic, and people will learn it better than one that isn't harmonic. So again, there's evidence here that in participants that come into the lab, somehow in their brains, they have some information that we see reflected in the languages of the world, even if they only speak one of those languages. Okay, so these universal patterns are somehow reflected in all of us, in you, in me, everyone you meet. So, does that mean that Chomsky is right? Is Chomsky right in assuming that we're all born with this universal grammar? It certainly seems like it, right? We've found evidence that we have this, these universal patterns um, in the way our brains work. Well, actually, I don't think he's right. And this is where it gets very controversial. And this is where a lot of my colleagues disagree with me. And there are a bit of debates about this in my field all the time. So why don't I think he's right? Well, I think what's going on is something actually a lot deeper and more interesting. So for Chomsky, we are born with linguistic knowledge. So this universal grammar is fundamentally linguistic in nature. So somehow, through some process, um, possibly a process of biological evolution, we're born knowing facts about language. And these are linguistic facts that are about language. What I want to suggest is that we, our brains do indeed shape the languages of the world and do indeed explain these universals and explain why we're getting these um, results in our experiments but they're actually driven by much more fundamental, much deeper um, features of the way our cognitive systems work. They are not inherently linguistic. They're more general. So for example, let's take that um, universal where languages that are either SVO or SOV. In both of those word orders, the first element is the subject, right? Now, in a typical sentence, the most sentences that are produced, the subject is the doer of an event that's being described, right? So the pirate is the one who's throwing, right, the saxophone. And it turns out, so we call that, that, that person doing something the agent. And it turns out that humans put a great deal of importance on agents in events. That makes sense, right? It's the, knowing who did something is extremely important. And so what we think is happening is that we have a bias 
to want to convey that information first. We have an agent-first bias. And that comes from our basic way that we construe events in the world. It's not specifically linguistic. It's, it affects language, but it's just about how we see things. And actually, we can explain why the throwing event had object verb order and the dreaming event had verb object order in a similar way. So if you think about it, when the pirate is throwing the saxophone, both the pirate and the saxophone exist prior to the throwing event. So it's actually more natural to convey the pirate and the saxophone and then throwing. So you establish the things that are in the event and then you describe what the relationship between those things is. Notice that's not true of dreaming. In a real sense, the dream created the saxophone, right? So the saxophone isn't prior to the dreaming event. And that's why the more natural order there is to have the subject, the verb, and the object. So these orders are actually result from the basic way in which humans think about events. So it's not specifically linguistic, it's much more general. Okay, so what about this harmonic uh, universal? Why would verb object order predict prepositions and object verb order predict postpositions? Well, once again, we believe that that actually arises from a more general feature of cognition. And I don't really have time to explain the details of it, but basically it's the idea that brains um, expect things to be predictable. So we actually go into the world um, expecting that one thing will predict another. And that's why we see these kind of harmonic patterns. And we've just literally last month completed a set of experiments, not published yet, um, where we can see that that see evidence for that. So what we did is we took one of our artificial language learning experiments and said, well, if what's driving this isn't specific to language, we should get the same patterns if we take the language part away. So we reconstructed our experiments, but instead of the, um, presenting participants with um, sentences in a miniature language, we instead created these very abstract patterns. So we had some visual patterns and we had some musical patterns. And we even had a version of the experiment where we played sequences of pulses into participants' thumbs. So extremely non-linguistic. But what we did is we carefully constructed these stimuli so they had, they were in, they had parallel patterns to the miniature languages we teach people. And it turns out that participants responded in exactly the same way to these non-linguistic stimuli as they do to the linguistic ones. We get exactly the same patterns where we have harmonic patterns being easier to learn than non-harmonic patterns. So this is evidence that what's driving the distribution of languages in the world is coming from us, it is coming from our brains and our cognitive systems, but it's coming from some, something from a much deeper place than just um, our linguistic knowledge. So I think it's actually wrong to say that humans are born with an innate knowledge of language, but rather the humans come to the world with certain kind of cognitive biases and expectations that then shape the way languages are. So what would the Martian linguist who's come to Earth really think? Well, I think if they're smart, the Martian linguist will recognize that languages vary, and they vary in significant and interesting ways. But those patterns of variation tell us something about the commonalities um, in, the, in the cognitive systems of the humans that create those languages. So what I want to emphasize to you all here is that the structure of language and the structure of our behaviors more generally arise from our common biological heritage. 
But echoing something that Diane Nelson said in her talk, last talk in the series last week, it's only by recognizing and celebrating the diversity of the languages of the world and the behaviors of the world and the cultures of the world that we can hope to reveal these commonalities that cross our species, the very essence of what it means to be human. <laughs> <laughs>